think we're back. Okay. I'm glad you came back. You never know when you give a talk with three parts, will they come back or not? <laughs> See everybody heading to the cars and driving away. One general comment to begin with, I think you know this, but it maybe it's worth reminding all of us. These are passages to live with over time, and that what we do this morning could be the beginning of a Lenten observance to go back to the woman at the well tonight or on Friday or next Sunday and just let it go deeper into it, be familiar with it, let it grow on you. And it might change over time. You see different things, you feel different things. So don't just think it's one time only and then gone, but, but um, bring it into your life, your imagination, your prayer as we go forward. There are many scenes in the Gospel, according to John, where such encounters take place. This one we have had with the woman at the well was certainly one of the first. But even before it, Jesus had multiplied the wine and filled you know, these large jugs, vases of wine, 180 gallons, they say, at the wedding feast where nobody expected a sign like this. Nicodemus comes to see Jesus in the night. And we don't hear much about Nicodemus after that night visit until he shows up at the cross and makes public, I am here to care for the body. He's brave in the end. But that's another encounter where somebody slowly becomes to see Jesus. Or chapter 6, if we had time, we could talk about the, mar the miracle of the multiplication of loaves and fishes and the big, big crowd that are hanging on every word of Jesus. And then as the chapter goes on, the crowd gets smaller and smaller and smaller until at the end, Jesus says to his immediate disciples, will you also go away? Will you leave? And Peter says, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And the reason I mention that, I think, is because John is no Pollyanna. Uh, he is hopeful, but he may not be optimistic. If you can distinguish between the two, he doesn't really believe that what we heard in chapter 4, where the woman is transformed, her townsmates are transformed, Jesus stays with them. He doesn't really think or believe that this will be the way the gospel works out over time. And I think he's very aware, writing at later time, 40, 50 years after the death of Jesus, uh, both looking back on kind of the darkness of the ministry of Jesus, where the opposition grew to him over time. And the fact that even perhaps in the church where John was living, there's a certain sense of kind of the darkness. The world is not necessarily on our side. And I think we need to attend to that as well. And so this chapter 9 of John really helps us to begin to enter literally the darkness of a man born blind, but also the darkness of those who refuse to see the light. Let me just read you the small part of it we begin with. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in this world, I am the light of the world. And when he said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes and said, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam. And he went and washed and came back able to see. And again, I think there's a certain dramatic contrast here. Jesus is the light who has come into the world. He's sent so that the works of God may be revealed. And what does he do when he sees this man spits in the mud, makes a paste, rubs it on his eyes. And it doesn't even immediately do anything. He says, go wash in the pool of Siloam, and then you will be well. A simple miracle, but I think J John is deliberately saying it's a hands-on miracle. Jesus' hands get muddy, the man's eyes get muddy, and the great work of God is done in all those muddy moments not in any grand moment where he appears in the temple and there's light everywhere. It's all done in this small, simple level. I think this reading, perhaps even contrasted and maybe intensifying 
what we heard in the John chapter 4 is in a sense a hopeless case and perhaps that's why John puts it forward and we get tricked into thinking it's only about the hopeless case but a man born blind and as the man says later in this chapter never in the history of the world has a man born blind been given back his sight because the eyes may be shriveled up there may be no eyeballs at all nothing to see nothing to recover impossible impossibility and this man who's we have no idea what age his parents are still living, so perhaps, let's say, 20-something, whatever. He is there, and everybody knows him as the man born blind. And they may speculate on this. Is he blind because of something he did? What, sinning in the womb? How does that work out? Or it, parents, it served them right. They did something wrong. We might today say, you know, the mother had the wrong diet or something, health problem while the, during the pregnancy. The man is born blind. And clearly, this man is trivialized to the extent of saying, it's like the leper over there or the prostitute over there. We don't even know this man's name. But we do know he is the disabled one. He is the one who cannot see. <coughs> and again, Jesus sees him. And the man doesn't ask, doesn't come up saying, please give me my sight. The parents don't bring him up and say, please do something. But Jesus sees a blind beggar and how easy it would be simply to pass him by. He can't see me, I can keep going. How many times do we and ourselves, when people are asking us for money, somebody sitting by the curbside, pass by, this is even easier because he cannot see. And yet Jesus stops, gets his hands dirty, he reaches out to the man and heals him. Now this, if this was not the Gospel of John, if this was Mark, let's say, Okay, you got the scene, now let's move on to something else, a teaching, another miracle, a trip, or whatever. But this is only the beginning of this passage in John's Gospel. For immediately, the question arises, wait a minute, this is not possible. This man is born blind, he cannot see. If we can't call him the, more, the man who is blind because he was born blind, then what do we call him? Again, we don't know his name. And they begin to ponder themselves, wait a minute, is this the man who's been sitting there for years by the roadside, begging and getting some daily gift from people passing by, or is it somebody else? Really, if people had their eyes open, they could say, well, obviously it's the same man. He's dressed the same way, he has the same beard, he has the same hair, he walks the same way. If you reduced him to his blindness and said, oh, he's not blind anymore, the only thing I ever knew about him was that he was blind. So he can't even tell whether this is the same man or not. And so the challenge arises, what to do about this? And the immediate concern of the neighbors, but then of the leaders of the people who come onto the scene is, this is not possible. It could not be done. Therefore, it did not happen. The whole thing about the man born blind, well, he wasn't really born blind. Um, he wasn't really the same man. It was somebody else who sat in his place. The impossibility of this scene. And then the leaders of the people become very annoyed, saying, well, look, we don't know who this Jesus is. He's doing things that are unacceptable, like curing on the Sabbath, which again, provocatively here, as in the Synoptic Gospel, Jesus does again and again. They're annoyed at that. And said, look, this man has been blind since birth. What's the rush? Leave him blind for another day. Why did you have to do it on the Sabbath? And they interrogate the man, and they want to find out from him, are you the man who was born blind? And it's kind of a bizarre, or maybe humorous dialogue. What did he do to you? Are you really able to see? Were you really blind? What did he do? He spat in the mud, he rubbed the mud on my eyes, I washed in the pool, and now I can see. That much I know, the man says. And they say, but who is he? How can he do this? He's a bad man. He can't do this for you. And so they drag in the parents and say, we'd like you to testify that your son was not really born blind. He was just faking it all these years. And this fake Jesus came along in order to cure him. It's all hype or something like that. It's a media event. And the parents said, all we know is that he was born blind. I am the mother. I know that. He was born blind. It's impossible. And they say, but how did it happen? Who is this Jesus who did it? And they interrogate again, and 
and they refuse to accept the fact that something extraordinary has happened. And the parents finally say, I don't know. He's of age. Go and ask him. And they draw him in again and ask him again. He says, I keep telling you, I don't know who the man was. I don't have a clear idea of his name. And yet I know I was blind and now I see. It's as different and clear as night and day, black and white. And they look at him and say, well, that's not right. And he says, do you know what you're talking about? You're the leaders of the people. You're supposed to be the wise ones. How can you possibly keep saying to me, obviously you're not born blind. Obviously this didn't happen. And even if it did happen, Jesus didn't do it because he's not the kind of person who would cure a blind person. So it gets all very complicated. And I think what John is trying to do is say that we may yearn for a simpler world in which miracles simply happen. Jesus comes and the man who is crippled walks. The woman who's been bleeding for years, he, she touches the hem of his robe and then she is cured. He passes by the, the bier of a young man being carried out, the, the only son of a mother who's a widow. And Jesus takes him by the hand and raises him. We want simple miracles or say, in 2023, they can't happen. And yet I think what John is trying to say is that in under non-ideal circumstances, when the world is against us, when the world doesn't think this can work, it begins to happen. Things that you think cannot change begin to change. And so by the end of the gospel, and I'll just before reading the passage I gave you, another one, at the very end, it ends on a negative note. It ends on a fight. Um, Jesus said, I came to the world for judgment that those who do not see may see and those who see can become blind. And the Pharisees say, are we blind? Not, we're not blind. We're the children of Moses. And Jesus says, if you were blind, you would not have sin, but you say we see and therefore your sin remains. And so the whole thing is twisted around that in our difficult world where some people are labeled the handicapped the disadvantaged, the crippled, the person that I only know by the fact of their disability, the blind, the lame, the leper. In that world, it's suddenly these righteous leaders who are put on the spot and they refuse to see. They refuse to see what's right before their eyes because they lived in the same town. They should have known this man and they should see. He couldn't see and now he sees and he keeps telling them all I know is that I was blind and now I see and they say sorry that can't happen they refuse to allow for something miraculous to happen and I think we can get caught in that too things can't change I'm too old to allow for change nothing is going to happen now I've been the way I am for all my life you've been the way you are all your life nothing is going to change and then something changes and you say I just told you nothing is going to change so it didn't happen uh, there's some other explanation. Jesus doesn't actually come into people's lives like that, so it didn't happen. The beautiful end of the passage, and I, I'll just read you one more section. When Jesus heard that they had driven out the man who had been born blind, because he's so obstinate and so insistent that I used to be blind and now I see, they tell him, leave the synagogue and do not come back. You may be a Jew by birth, but you're not welcome in our community because you're being problematic. You are disturbing us by giving us impossible things like being blind and seeing. So Jesus went and found the man and said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, Who is he, sir? Tell me that I may believe in him. And this in itself is a very beautiful scene. I don't know how many gospel passages there are where Jesus goes looking for somebody. And this man apparently came back to Jesus, it says at the beginning. His eyes are opened. And then probably he wanders away and he's talking to the leaders of the people and his parents are drawn in and Jesus has moved on. But when Jesus hears about the controversy, Jesus goes looking for him. Because I think he realizes the only, it's not the only thing about this person was born blind, but this is a real human being. This person has other needs, other concerns, and you can't just wave a magic wand and say blind, not blind, crippled, not crippled, cancer, not cancer, etc., etc. No, I need to find this man and talk to him. And this man still, in a sense, is blind. You know, again, it says, tell me, sir, who he is, that I may believe in him. 
now he can see and he's face to face with Jesus and he still doesn't quite know he's open to it but unlike the Pharisees or like the Pharisees he still doesn't really understand who he's looking at and to whom he is speaking and I think we can be aware of this too and I think he's, John is pointing this out we can blame all our problems in life on our disabilities or drawbacks or handicaps or some lamentable thing in our family or at work or in church. All those things are the reasons. And yet, when your eyes have been opened and when you see Jesus face to face, say, tell me, Master, where he is so that I can see him. Missing the point that he now is right before our eyes. And Jesus tells him, and then as it says, <coughs> you have seen him, he is the one speaking to you. The man said, "A oh Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. In a sense, this is the real cure. The leaders of the people are showing their blindness, showing the impossibility of changing or allowing other people to change. Nobody is allowed to be except what they were from birth. And this man, suddenly his eyes are open, his spiritual eyes are open, and he falls down on the ground and worships Jesus. I think John is saying, even when most people turn away, even when the parents back off and say, oh, he's, he's grown up, let him talk for himself, even when other people don't get it, and there are no disciples you know, in most of the story, who knows what the apostles are up to, the man suddenly realizes, oh, this is the son of God, this is the son of man, and he falls down and worships him. So I think where this leaves us as we begin to run out of time here, in general, is this and contemplation of change in the lives of people who are impossible to change. It could be looking in the mirror and saying, I'm too old for this. I can't change at this point in my life. I cannot be different. Everybody knows me exactly as who I am. Again, person born blind, person who's crippled, person who's an alcoholic, person who's divorced, <coughs> person who has a really no annoying personality, person who is always evasive, person who talks too much, and on and on, all the things we can say about each other, and they're never going to change. And suddenly Jesus upsets us by saying, guess what? I can come into your life and you can change. Or I can come into the life of the person next to you and that person can change. And we have an invitation before us, I think John is saying, you can go with the flow and be like this man who is physically blind spiritually clueless but then came to see spiritually and say yes the impossible happens or we can be like the leaders of the people say nope it didn't happen he couldn't do it it can't be done Jesus is not the one and they just refuse to see and while the Par Pharisees were good people we don't have to think that they had horns and were demons these are good people but people who somehow refuse to believe that change was possible and so I leave you with the four questions how do I react to people who are disadvantaged, blind, poor, outcast? You're only talking to yourself unless you want to share with somebody, but honest about we're not supposed to be prejudiced or racist or looking down on people, but what do I really, in my heart of hearts, how do I react to people? How do I think of people who are blind, poor, outcast? The man born blind suddenly is able to see do I believe that by faith in Jesus, people can really change their lives? Can you think of examples of that? Or do you really think it isn't going to happen? Here we are in this room, and none of us is really going to change until the day we die. No, it can happen. The enemies of Jesus resent the fact that he gave sight to the man born blind. Do I rejoice when God very clearly intervenes and transforms people we know and assume could never change? What do you do when the person you assume you knew exactly and you had them totally, you got them completely, you know their ins and outs, you know their weaknesses, and you say, again, this one, that one, that one never changes, and then suddenly the person says, Jesus has come into my life and changed me. Do we like that idea? Are we annoyed and say, those oh, sounds like you become a Pentecostal or something like that? No. Do we really think that Jesus can touch somebody and actually make a difference in their lives? And if it's the person next to me and not me, do we get resentful and say, well, why them and not me? 
why do other people get changed and I don't get changed? Maybe it didn't actually happen. They're not really different. In a year from now, they'll be back to being an alcoholic again or something. All that kind of thing. And then finally, in the end, Jesus seeks and finds the man a second time. Now he can see Jesus physically and spiritually, and he believes. And so have there been times in my life when recovery from an illness or the overcoming of some real problem has led me to encounter God directly? Have you ever been lost and found? Have you ever found that God came looking for you and found you by surprise? So I think enough there to go for 20 minutes.